107 and the first beginning of 107, look at the first three sections of 107 and the Buddha is telling you right there what it is he's exactly teaching. What is he teaching? Well, he's teaching you something that you learn. He says, my teaching is a gradual training, a gradual practice, and a gradual progress step of the staircase down to the very deepest levels. So why would you come to me and learn meditation and expect to be able to just go through the whole path and through? When you hear us talk about people being able to get to the path and see the different levels all the way down, they can't usually get through. Sometimes they'll go through one time, that's into the sotapanna, what we think is the sotapanna level, okay? But it's connected with how much they understand in the Dhamma. And our system is like a meet and agree and understand these levels are actually really real, which is a real shock to people. These jhanas are real and exactly as they are described as you pass through the levels down the path. And each one gives you a new set of knowledge to discover, okay? So Kwa, my point to you is to remember that those aggregates are not miserable and awful and we're supposed to think of ourselves and our body as a bag of rotten potatoes because it's every part of us is suffering all the time. It's not like that. It's not like that. Those aggregates are labeled as suffering only when Atta is involved and I take everything personally and I'm craving and clinging affects the aggregates. That's what the problem is. So do I tell the guy who went to the health club, it is a muscle bound Arnold Schwarzenegger that once he gets through to maybe being a soda pana, he should never go to the gym again and ever practice in the gym? No, why shouldn't he? But I was clowning around with him afterwards and I said to him, just don't spend so much time in front of the mirror flexing your muscles anymore. You don't have to get into this whole thing. You know, even an interesting thing is in, in the Christians, they have a wonderful saying, we are supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. I wonder where they learned that. You all who know me and know my feelings about, um, you know, Jesus and the Buddha and some other things, you know, I think they all went to the same school somewhere sometime. <laughs> I think they have very much in common. And the Buddha taught this for all humanity. We need to never, ever, ever forget that. Now it's time for me to turn this over to Bonte. I hope that this has helped you guys a little bit. Uh, when you write your questions, since everybody's here now, when you write your questions, please put them together after the talk or the next morning so that we have some, I have some time because I have to go through it and put them in a Word document and then I have to put them on paper if I'm gonna let him see what they are um, be, before the next talk. It, sometimes I can sit with him, but we sit with uh, doing this, we wanna sit with it close to when the talk happens. I don't want people to send me questions an hour before this one starts. Okay, you ready to try again? Yes, Bante. The importance of being able to recognize craving when it first starts to arise cannot be understated. You have to have strong mindfulness, okay? You wanna be able to see that tension and tightness as soon as it begins. But don't put so much energy into it that it's gonna cause you a headache. The thing with this practice is there has to be really good balance between the effort that you put out and the lightness of mind that you use. So when the, the uh, Visaka is asking about the renewal of being. It's always talking about craving. That is the cause of all suffering. Then 
he says to uh, Venerable Damadina, cessation of identity, cessation of identity is said. What is called the cessation of identity, identity by the Blessed One. It is the remainderless fading away, ceasing, the giving up, the relinquishing, the letting go, the relaxing and the rejecting of that same craving. Now, this is something that you can, you can test and see for yourself. Every time there is any kind of disturbance that arises, that means there's craving in your mind. And as soon as you use the six R's, you allow it to be, you relax, you smile, you come back to your object of meditation. You'll notice that your mind doesn't have any distractions in it anymore at that time. And that's what it's talking about with the, the remainderless fading away and ceasing, the giving up, the relinquishing. That's what it's talking about. Every time you use the six R's and let go of that craving, your mind is pure. Your mind is alert. Your mind is different. An awful lot of people, when they're doing a practice, they only think that it's time to do meditation when I'm sitting. And that's just not it. Do you have hindrances arise in your daily activity? Well, if you do and you don't use the six R's, then you're causing yourself a lot more suffering. So it's a real necessary part of the practice to get into the habit of using the six R's whenever your mind gets distracted in your daily activities. Come back to what you're doing while you're doing it. Come back to having a light mind having a mind that's uplifted. It's a very necessary part of practicing the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Then the Saka says the way leading to the cessation of identity what is called the way leading to the cessation of identity by the Blessed One. Friend Visaka, it is just this noble eightfold path that is, now I'm going to start naming off the different folds of the eightfold path but I really don't like the idea of calling it right or wrong. That means that life is black or white and life is never black and white. Life is always more fluid than that. So when, when the, the sutta says, I, I'm going to teach right view, okay, I, I translate that a little bit differently. And I say, this is harmonious perspective instead of right or wrong. Right view, what is right view? I call it harmonious perspective. It is seeing without craving in your mind at all. Where your mind is very alert, your mind is very 
clear and bright. And your mind is pure. That's what right view or harmonious perspective is all about. The second fold of the eightfold path is they call it uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi has uh, changed the definition from the earlier book that he that he used for the Majjhima Nikaya, and now he calls it right intention. And I really don't like that definition at all. I call this harmonious imaging. When you image things in your mind, you hold an image of being happy. You hold an image of being successful. You hold an image of being sad. Whatever image you're holding, that is where your mind tends to go. So the more clear you are with your imaging, a lot of people I know, I live in a very poor section of, of the United States and a lot of people hold the image of being poor. As a result, they're poor. I hold the image of being very successful. As a result, I am successful. I think of myself that way. That's what imaging is all about. I think of my, myself being happy. My mind has a lot of balance in it. These are the kind of images that I'm holding of myself. So you have to be careful about the things that you keep in your mind. You're always this. And if you hold that image, you can be real, have, have a real unhappy life because you always project out being unhappy. So what kind of an image are you holding of yourself? Are you holding an image that you're always very mindful, that you're always very alert, that you're always uplifted? The more you hold these kind of images, the more you become that, okay? So I, I really don't like the idea of right thought or right intention. The reason I don't care for the word intention is because it's misused in an awful lot of ways. Imaging is not. And people like to blame themselves if they, if they say, well, my intention wasn't pure enough. And that causes all kinds of problems. So I try to stay away from the, the, that kind of understanding. The next fold of the Eightfold Path is harmonious communication. Harmonious communication is having a kind of communication that is uplifting and happy. Who do you talk with more than anybody else in the world? Yourself, right? How much time do you spend beating yourself up because you didn't do something the way it should have been done? or the way you think it should have been done. 
being kind to yourself. One of the biggest problems that people have, especially when they first start doing the meditation, is they have preconceived ideas about what meditation actually is. And they become frustrated, they become angry, they beat themselves up, they tell themselves they, don't, they aren't doing it right. And all of these unwholesome states that arise are causing you more and more suffering. So you have to learn how to be more gentle with yourself, more accepting of yourself, lighter with yourself. Don't be fighting with yourself. Quite often people will come and they'll do a retreat with me and they'll get to a place where they say, oh, I have, my mind is just running all over the place. It does this and that, it just won't stop. And what is my cure for that? I tell them, you're not smiling enough. You're taking things personally. You're judging yourself. You're criticizing yourself. You're frustrated with yourself because mind isn't doing what you think it ought to do. So you have to soften your communication. You have to like yourself. You're gonna make mistakes, welcome to the human race. Everybody makes mistakes. But that doesn't give you the clarity of mind that you need so you can forgive yourself and be happy with yourself even when you do make a mistake. I spend a lot of time on each retreat reminding people to be gentle with themselves. And the more gentle you are with your communication, the easier everything in life becomes. So be kind with yourself. Don't be fighting with yourself because you think that at your mind is supposed to do this or that. Mind will do whatever it's going to do sometimes and it's okay for it to do it. Just gently 6R, kind of laugh with yourself about how crazy mind can become. And come back to your loving kindness. So harmonious communication is, has a lot more to do with the communication that you have with yourself than it does with your communication with other people. Although you do wanna have harmonious communication with other people. One of the things that I've started to notice more and more is that all of the different countries I'm going to now, they seem to have a lot of uh, cursing kind of speech. And that kind of speech, when you use it, it hurts you more than it hurts anybody else because there's a lot of aversion, dislike, dissatisfaction with that kind of speech. A lot of anger. So please start using more gentle kinds of speech to everyone else around you. 
This is harmonious communication. Okay, the next fold of the Eightfold Path is, they call it um, right action, and I call it harmonious movement. Harmonious movement means a gentle kind of movement, not jerking your mind around not trying to force your mind to do what you want it to do. But it has to be harmonious. It has to be in balance. The whole point of the Eightfold Path is so that your mind can develop more and more equanimity in it and not cause upset, not cause problems by jerking your mind around, by not liking this, by trying to force your mind to do th this or that. Relax. Smile into things. The next fold of the Eightfold Path is Harmonious lifestyle. They call it, in, in Bhikkhu Bodhi's book, they call it uh, livelihood. And they give definitions of right livelihood of not killing living beings and uh, Uh, selling poisons and, and this type of thing. But I call it harmonious lifestyle because it depends what do you put in your mind? You read the newspaper every day. Does that make you happy? Does that make you more ready to go out and do things in your daily activities? Or do you read the newspapers and get upset because it's all negative news? I had one student at a, a long time ago that she read five newspapers a day. Five. Wow. And she was really unhappy. She was suffering all the time. And all she talked about was stuff that she learned in the newspaper. Well, the newspaper is not really the kind of news you want to pay attention to. I ask her, why do you read so many newspapers in a day? Well, I have to keep up with what's happening in the world. No, you don't really need to do that. What you need to do is give up reading those unwholesome things and Practice harmonious communication with yourself and other people. The whole thing with practicing the six R's is learning how to have an uplifted mind, a happy mind, a mind that's more accepting, that has more equanimity in it. And reading the newspaper or watching the news on the television does not lead to having an uplifted, happy mind. It leads more and more to anger and dissatisfaction and pain. So I told her that 
I, I wanted her to stop reading and stop watching the television. After a couple of weeks, she started feeling a lot more happy and a lot more positive. So what did she put in her mind instead of these unwholesome things? She went out and she got some cartoon books and just started reading cartoons every day. And they made her laugh. And the more she laughed, the more clear her mind became. And the lighter her mind became. And the happier her life became. So be careful what you put in front of your mind. I've told this story many hundreds of times. But I had a lady that was complaining to me about having nightmares. So I asked her, why are you having nightmares? She said, I don't know. But it seems to happen every time I go to the movies. That night I have nightmares. I said, what kind of movies are you watching? Oh, I like horror stories. So I said, okay, then why don't you let go of the horror stories and not watch them anymore? And she said, oh, but I love it. I love to get me be scared. So I told her, don't come to me and complain about having nightmares. You're doing that to yourself. So be careful what kind of influence you put in front of your mind. Again, be kind to yourself. The next fold of the Eightfold Path, this is the key thing in the Eightfold Path. Now, all of, these, all of these folds of the Eightfold Path, they need to be intertwined with each other. The next fold of the Eightfold Path, they call it right effort. I don't call it that. I call it harmonious practice. The more gentle your practice is, the more loving your practice is, the more smiling you have, the easier everything becomes. The six fold, the, the, the six R's, excuse me, the six R's are right effort. The six R's are the path leading to the cessation of suffering. The six R's are the Eightfold Path. Every time you use the six R's, you're purifying your mind more and more. Why? Because you're letting go of craving, you're becoming more and more clear with how your mind actually works. You start to develop more and more equanimity towards everything that you're going through. And this is the whole point of the Eightfold Path. You know, it's real interesting. I, I did a, a Burmese kind of meditation for 20 years. And they always told me about the Eightfold Path. They said, right speech, right action, right livelihood, 
these are all part of morality, sila. And you don't have to pay attention to those while you're doing the sitting meditation. That happens automatically. But it always bothered me when they told me that. And I started talking to them, talking to different people that were teachers, but also students that were practicing with me. And I kept on saying, that's not part of the Eightfold Path. They're turning the Eightfold Path into the Fivefold Path. Because they're saying, well, you don't have to pay attention to, the, to this, to these three kinds of uh, sila. And it always bothered me. Then, after a few years, they started talking about uh, right concentration, the last of the Eightfold Path. And they, they changed the definition of uh, right concentration always before it was talking right concentration was about the jhanas first jhana second jhana third jhana fourth jhana it was always about the jhanas but then when they started teaching neighborhood concentration apana samadhi and moment-to-moment -moment concentration, they said, that's as much concentration as you need. So they started changing the Eightfold Path into a Fourfold Path that didn't agree with what the Buddha was talking about. But when you practice the six Rs and you practice it with sincerity and clarity, your mind is going to be more and more relaxed while you're doing the practice. And you're gonna start having personality development. You're gonna be more and more accepting of things and not arguing so much. So the The six R's are absolutely necessary for your practice in the Buddha's teaching. The next fold of the Eightfold Path, they call it right Mindfulness, I call it harmonious observation. The definition of mindfulness is remembering to observe how mind's attention moves from one thing to another. Observing that movement using the six R's along with that and eventually you start to get to a more and more clear, spacious mind. And it's very necessary. There are so many different definitions of mindfulness. It's really kind of amazing. This practice is about patience. <laughs> Good. The thing with mindfulness that is very um, 
important for you to understand is as you start to go deeper in your meditation, your mindfulness starts changing a little bit and you start seeing more and more subtle movements of mind's attention. And then you use a relaxed step and you'll be able to sit for long periods of time with strong mindfulness. The last fold of the Eightfold Path, they call it right concentration, and I really don't like that word. Because concentration, there's all different forms of concentration, and it uh, gets very confusing. If you don't use the six R's, with your meditation, with any disturbance that pulls your attention away, if you don't use the six R's and come back to your object of meditation, you will start developing a different kind of concentration that is called apana samadhi. And that means absorption kinds of concentration, one-pointedness kinds of concentration, where the concentration becomes so strong that it suppresses the hindrances. Now you can get into very pleasant, peaceful kinds of practice very blissful, but you really don't learn very much. You just are, are able to sit in a quiet mind for long periods of time. The thing with the Buddha's teaching that is very important to understand is the teaching that he gave us is always about understanding what you're doing while you're doing it. When you practice one-pointed concentration, you're just focusing on one thing, and one thing only. And you don't really teach yourself anything about how hindrances arise and what to do with them when they do arise and how to let them go. So it's a real important facet of the Eightfold Path that you use uh, the six R's with your practice. Now one of the amazing things is when you use the six R's with your practice, that means the harmonious practice that you're, you're practicing. Your progress in the meditation is so much faster with this kind of meditation than any other kind of meditation that the Buddha taught. And I'm very used to having fast progress with people that are practicing meditation. If I don't see you starting to go deeper after the second day of a retreat, I start asking you, what are you doing with your practice? Why is your practice going so poorly? Why are you not progressing with your meditation? So when you practice the six R's, and you're sincere with it, you will be successful with the meditation. And when you start thinking about the, during the time of the Buddha, he was teaching all kinds of people. Some people were very highly intelligent. Some people were not. Some people were very simple. 
and he had to use a kind of language that was easy for them to understand and he had to have a practice that was easy to do or else they wouldn't practice it. So when I was practicing the, with the Burmese and doing that, that style of meditation, I did a practice that I did for five years before I figure out what the meditation wasn't. Before I started figuring out what the meditation was supposed to be. And I went through immeasurable amounts of suffering because of that. Both mental and physical. But with this, this practice that I'm, I'm showing you with the six R's, this practice, your progress is fast. I don't want you to be sitting in a posture where it causes a lot of pain. I want you to sit in a way where you're comfortable. And I know of people in, in India, they've always been sitting on the floor cross-legged. But they only sit for about 20 minutes before they start getting antsy and start moving around because they get pains coming up. So I rather encourage that you sit with a chair. Sit on a chair, sit comfortably. Don't force yourself to have pain. Pain is not your friend. So it's an amazing thing. Uh, I'm looking at the clock right now. You're okay, we're going over. Okay. Just say that we're going over till nine o'clock. We're going to be going over till nine o'clock, so I can keep talking. Anybody who wants to leave. So, when I left the kind of meditation that I'd been doing for so many years and, and started being more curious about other kinds of meditation. I first put, picked up the suttas and they were from the uh, Polytech Society. And the Polytech Society is, is a great work. And a lot of people have, have benefited from it, but it's now it's old English. It was done at the turn of the last century. So it's kind of hard to understand. But when Bhikkhu Bodhi came out with his translation of the Digani or the Majjhima Nikaya, it was done in more modern kinds of prose, more modern kinds of English. And he did a magnificent job with his work with the translation. Although you might hear me complain about some of the uh, words that are translated this way or that way. But that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate everything that he did in his translation. It just means that I have a different opinion of some of the words. It's, it's not that I'm complaining about it. It's not that I'm criticizing it. I just prefer to use other words that seem to work a little bit better. So, are you still able to hear me? 
yes yes bande yes okay yes okay good thank you Need somebody with a sign to hold it up with every five minutes. <laughs> yeah, but there's there's no pictures of them. I know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when I when I started reading uh, some of the books of Vinaya, the the books of discipline. There's places, there's some of the books that are, have a lot of good stories in them. And when there, there's one section in book number five, the Mahavaga, that it talks about the Buddha from the time that he started doing meditation to the different teachers that he went to and the practices that he used and how he came up with the Eightfold Path and how it was a lot more um, clear about what he was talking about. During the time of the Buddha, uh, there was a lot of uh, practices that they were very difficult and hard to do. Every 10 years here in India, there's a get together with all of the spiritual diff disciplines that uh, that's being practiced here. And I saw some pictures of some of the practices that they do. I saw a picture of a man that he held his arm up over his head for 10 years without bringing it down. And if he tried to bring his arm down, he would have such pain because of the uh, the blood and that sort of thing. It just would be horrible. But how can you get enlightened just by holding your hand up? There was another man that he was the somersault uh, guru. And he somersaulted every day for 1,500 miles. He would just do somersaults over and over and over and over and over. And how do you get enlightened by doing that? But there's a lot of people that are willing to try a lot of different kinds of practices that cause immense pain in the body. And that's why the Buddha said, you don't want to, you don't want to be too harsh. You don't want to be doing that kind of practice because that causes a lot of aversion in your mind. It causes a lot of upset. And even to this day, there's an awful lot of people that do uh, body tortures where they don't eat and there's um, one one monk that i ran across he only ate once every two weeks one meal every two weeks but that meal that he ate was so big that he didn't lose weight and he he would eat a whole stock of bananas, you know, the, the big stock. And then he would go off and eat something else. And he might eat for three or four days in a row, pretty much all day. And then he'd go off and he wouldn't eat again for two weeks. And that, that kind of thing is really a torture for your body and it's not necessary.
remember that the Sudhi, uh, the Dhammapada tells us something very, very necessary for the first part of our practice. And that is mind is a forerunner of all states. I made they are. And the more we start recognizing that mind is the forerunner. It doesn't mean that you don't have body, but it starts in mind. All of the feeling that arises starts in mind. And the more you practice keeping the Eightfold Path and practicing the Eightfold Path, the clearer your mind becomes. So, I'm going to sign off now. So please, let me give you a blessing. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all May all the for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May the inhabiting space and